welcome everybody uh, to this week's DeFord lecture. Uh, we're very happy today to have with us uh, Natalie Mahawald, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from, uh, from uh, Cornell University. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about Natalie and her, uh, what she's going to be talking about uh, in just a minute um, uh, from Gita Prasad. Um, as all of you know, the DeFord Lecture Series is a long-standing tradition here in the Department of Geological Sciences dating back from the 1940s. Uh, it's been a venue for uh, having uh, distinguished scientists, uh, both from within the Jackson School and from uh, outside presenting their research. It's named after uh, Ronald Kinison DeFord, who was a faculty member and a graduate advisor in the department for many years, um, starting in 1948, and who was instrumental in um, organizing and running what was at the time known as technical sessions. Um, so continuing in this long tradition, uh, as I said, we're very happy to have uh, Natalie Mahawald uh, talking with us today and to tell us a little bit more about uh, what we're going to be hearing about uh, is Gita Prasad. Great, thanks, John. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Natalie Mahawal to give the DeFord lecture today. She is the Irving Porter Church Professor of Engineering in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Cornell University. And she's also the co-leader of their working group on reducing climate risk for the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability. So a really broad reaching set of expertise. Her research group is focused on understanding feedbacks in the Earth system that can impact climate change, and this includes atmospheric transport of biogeochemically important species like desert dust, as well as the carbon cycle. And she is a fellow of AMS, AGU, and the AAAS, and has been a lead author of two IPCC reports, so a, a very celebrated scientist. And I would say Dr. Mawal's work has been really opening the scientific community's eyes to the importance of atmospheric transport of all of these species, um, dust, wildfire smoke for decades now, and, and really encouraging us to think more carefully about what the uncertainties are and what is in our atmosphere that we're not thinking about that we should be. And so the work that she's presenting today, I think really demonstrates that same innovation now into the arena of microplastics. So today she'll be sharing some findings from a recent PNAS paper that looks at the atmospheric limb of the global microplastic pollution cycle that has been getting increasing public and policy attention of late. So I'm, I'm very excited for this talk. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mahawal to introduce us to the talk. Great, well, thank you um, very much for that very nice introduction. I'm not sure I recognize myself there, but um, I, um, I have been working on uh, aerosols for a very long time. Um, I'm kind of a, a person who puts new aerosols into um, the models, usually the climate models, but I also run forest with reanalysis um, and thinking about the interactions. So um, this, this um, paper came about because of um, basically our curiosity. And I, I hope you can see my screen. Does it all look right there, Gita? Okay. So, um, um, I'm going to talk about constraining the atmospheric limb of the, the plastic cycle, especially microplastics in the atmosphere. And this really came out uh, because my um, colleague, Janice Brainy, um, was doing a study looking at dust and phosphorus inputs to the Western United States. And she and I have written a couple of papers together uh, looking at that, where I'm looking at the atmospheric uh, modeling of those, and she measures it and takes a look at the ecosystem impacts. So um, she sent me um, an email in, uh, what was it? It was, it was before COVID, right before COVID, saying, Natalie, do you want to model microplastics? Because I have this weird data set. Um, and so she sent me the results of a, a paper that she um, published in, in um, Science. That, that's what this figure comes from, the Brainy um, et al. 2020, where she and her colleagues had looked at microplastics. And so uh, we put together this paper trying to understand what her data meant in, from a, um, a model data synthesis perspective. So she, um, again, was, was um, looking in the Western United States at the inputs of dust and phosphorus. And she, on her filters, found these weird things, this dark blue um, fiber, bright blue fiber, Here's a little pink thing. And she just was wondering what in the world they were. And so she um, you know, wanted to make sure they weren't contamination, you know, what's going on. And um, basically from that analysis, you know, she 
made sure there weren't contamination, but she figured out that these are actually microplastics and um, went and measured these microplastics. And her, her data set is, is just amazing in terms of what it provides us. Um, and so she and I, along with my um, postdoc at the time, a graduate student working with Kim Prather and um, uh, Zig Clement, who had some emission data set, and Toshi Matsu, who had created a more flexible framework in, in my group to, to do the modeling, I published this paper last year. And um, so the, 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 the question is, how in the world do you model the atmospheric transport of some weird looking fiber that um, like, like this blue fiber that's one micron wide and, and 200 microns long, for example. You know, this kind of uh, particle that, that might make a little more sense, it's somewhat spherical, but um, it, you know, this is what we're trying to do, these very funny shapes and, and trying to understand what the sources and the, the sinks of these are. So again, here's a, a figure from um, the 2020 paper that um, Janice Brainy and her co-authors made, just, just looking at some images of, of what these microplastics look like. And um, you know what caught her eye was the bright colors on them, but you actually have to double check that they're microplastics and not some kind of cotton or something. And you do that in FTIR. Amazing. So um, it, her study was really focused on the Western United States. And if you look at the names of those and you recognize any of those, they're, they're actually um, remote regions, um, national parks or wilderness areas. And so you know she wanted to look at the remote transport of um, dust and phosphorus there. So that, that's the data set that we have to look at the microplastics. And what she came up with was um, about 2% of the mass going into these regions is actually microplastics. It's, it's not dust or other anthropogenic pollutants, it's 2%. And, and we were really surprised, and she was really surprised at, at the sheer quantity of that. What was really unique about her data set is she had uh, 313 individual data points from both dry and wet deposition um, during specific time periods. So she had 11 sites, but she had either monthly or weekly data um, from these sites. So um, before this time, there was maybe 10 to 20 data sets uh, anywhere in the world, okay? So she really increased by you know, one or two orders of magnitude how much data we had. And in addition, she did a really careful analysis of the size. I mean, we can't possibly talk about the transport in the atmosphere unless we know what the size is. Um, and so, you know, the fibers, this is the length of the fibers, and they're all about one micron thick. And then here's the, um, the particles um, and the sizes. And so this is pretty much unique in, in terms of the world, uh, in terms of measurements. And that's why she got it published in Science Magazine. I mean, it's just so much um, information. Now, it is extremely painful. Um, <laughs> I was just talking to Carrie Kenny about this, but it's extremely painful to make these measurements. Um, and you can't make them below four micron um, because you're actually specific, pulling out individual um, uh, you know, microplastics and counting them and measuring them, okay. So this unique data set is what she um, sent me. And then we took a look at, well, what can we do with this? Because this is way more information than we had. And we were really just uh, surprised at the amount of mass in the atmosphere. And, and for me, I'm, a, I'm really interested in atmospheric transport and um, I love working on new problems. And um, so, you know, that's, we, you know, I started out in dust, but we did phosphorus, we did iron, we, you know, copper, all these different constituents. Um, I just love to think about what are the sources and the sinks and how can we constrain them and what are our uncertainties? So this is, um, you know, a, a really interesting new problem is, is what I uh, was thinking about for this. And, and one that's a, a little bit, um, scary in some ways. You know, more and more in the, in the uh, literature, there's been increasing emphasis on plastic. So here's a, a paper on life cycle analysis of, of different kinds of plastics from Roland Geyer. Um, and, you know, you, you go back to 1950, there's almost none. And, uh, you know, where are we today? We're about here. And there's a huge increase. And, and we only think there's going to be an accelerating increase in the amount of plastics generated. And then you know, what, what happens to the plastics? Are they discarded? Are they recycled? Are they incinerated? Or, you know, are they mismanaged as well? Um, there's a lot of different lifetimes for different kinds of plastics um, in, out in the world. Um, and, you know, you, you know, you really have to think about the whole life cycle of that. There have been measurements of microplastics in the Arctic region. Um, here they, uh, they found them on some ice flows, for example.
And um, so they're, they're reaching everywhere, basically. Now, when I think about plastics, I don't know about you, but when I first started this problem, when I think about plastics, I think about all that plastics accumulating in the ocean, for example. And here's some coastal regions, but of course, the, there's also the, the plastics in the gyres. So there, there is a little bit of data about the distribution of plastics in the, in the gyres. So this is only, uh, ocean trawl data here from, um, compiled in the Van Sybil paper. And um, you, you can see higher concentrations of numbers here, um, as well as mass in, in the center of the gyres, um, especially in the Northern hemisphere. So it's kind of the accumulation of plastics. Now, they, the oceanographers called this everything under four millimeters microplastics, but um, that's not what we in the atmosphere would call microplastics. So um, what, what Janice was measuring here is, is everything below four microns, and we just switched to everything below four millimeters, okay? So three, three orders of magnitude difference um, is what we're talking about. But, um, but you still, there's quite a bit of mass out there in the middle of the ocean. So um, we were wondering if, if that could be a source of, of microplastics to these stations. Um, and of course, there's you know, a lot of studies just talking about the mismanaged um, plastics and how plastic marine debris are you know, doubling over 10 or 20 year timescales um, in some of these papers. And it's really, you know, what, what happens in the future is going to depend on the mismanaged plastics, but people are really worried about what's going on in the oceans. Well, we had just done a paper with um, Gavin Cornwell, um, where, um, who's in Kim Prather's group at UCSD, where they showed using their wind wave tunnel that insoluble dust um, that's deposited onto the ocean, for example, would be re-entrained into the atmosphere as part of the you know, sea spray mechanism. Um, and so uh, basically, you know, the, the same mechanisms that, that create sea spray, right? You, you just get a bubble um, that's thrown out into the, um, into the atmosphere that's you know, mostly water, but the water evaporates and it leaves then the aerosols in the atmosphere. Well, we speculated then that the same um, source could be operating with microplastics. I mean, it, it turns out that insoluble particles are, there's uh, several studies showing this. I, I don't have the citation here, but there's several studies showing that insoluble particles are actually carried upward in the ocean on bubbles. As, as, uh, and so they can kind of concentrate on the surface and there's a, a really large concentration right at the surface. And then of course you have organic material at the surface of the ocean as well, which could trap um, aerosols. Um, and in that paper, we were talking about the impact on the ice nuclei in the Southern Ocean, as you might, if it's coming from Kim Prather's group, it might have something to do with ice nuclei. Um, but we just speculated if that's operating, it should, have, it should work for microplastics as well. There's no reason why um, if they were floating on the top of the ocean, they wouldn't also be able to be entrained into the atmosphere. So um, while we were in the middle of our study, um, Dee and Steve Allen and their colleagues um, published a paper showing exactly that, uh, um, showing you know, a mechanism that was very similar to what we were arguing would be the mechanism. And they actually went out and made measurements um, on the coast in France of onshore winds and offshore winds. And the onshore winds from the ocean had much higher concentrations of microplastics, okay? So here's a little bit of independent um, validation that our purely speculative source actually, you know, a little bit of observational um, uh, um, support for that. So what, what other sources are there in the literature? Well, um, it turns out that agricultural fields can have microplastics in them as well. And of course, agricultural fields that are dry and unvegetated with strong winds are dust sources. Um, you know, and that's kind of what I do for a living. Is, so that's something that we took a look at. And it turns out about 55% of the biosolids in the US waste treatment plants are actually taken out. You know, that, that's it's collection of the wastewater there. and um, they're taken out and they're applied to agricultural soils. And if microplastics get into the waste stream that way, almost all of them are retained in the biosols. So they're being preferentially put onto agricultural fields if they get into the wastewater treatment plants. Um, and um, people have measured microplastics then uh, in agricultural fields. Um, and uh, this is in um, Ontario, Canada. In addition, um, in, in China, there's a bunch of measurements that show that if you put plastic films on your agricultural fields to try to suppress um, weeds or 
um, uh, keep the temperatures more modulated or reduce you know, drying out, then um, it actually increases the amount of microplastics in the field. So there's a, there's a lot of different practices that we're currently doing that would put microplastics into um, agricultural fields. Um, there, there aren't very many observations. Um, here I'm listing, what, five papers or something? Um, and you know, it's a huge range of, of how much microplastics are being measured in these soils. Um, but it does seem like there, there could be microplastics in agricultural soils that then could dry out and be a, a source. Um, a more well-documented source is the trier and breakware source. And so people have, have been looking at this for a while. You can see some of these papers are 20, 30 years old, just saying, hey, look, you know, the, <laughs> the, the tire wear is going to cause things to break off the tires and um, that um, people have measured microplastics close to roads and they then took that and um, estimated a source. And so this was actually modeled in the Evangelou paper. So they um, had, you know, kind of from um, just uh, how many miles driven and um, how many cars made um, a couple different data sets of the tire and brake wear and um, some estimates for the emissions and then just took a look at, at what the distribution would be and, and argued that you can get quite a bit of microplastics from tire and brake wear into the high latitudes, for example, um, is what this paper showed. And um, this came out uh, right as we were uh, almost ready to submit, I think, our paper. Um, and uh, so they, they argue in, in their paper that it's the shear forces between the tread and the pavement, and that generates these, you know, kind of coarse particles, but um, the, the microplastics that we're taking a look at. There could also be volatilization um, generating these particles. Um, tires are not pink and blue. And if you remember what made Janice actually pay attention to these, if they were black, she would not have noticed because they could have been rocks or black carbon, but the, the bright colors are, a, a good fraction of the mass, okay? And so that, that you know, they can't be, the, that can't be the only thing. So we, um, we just speculate that it could be that, um, you know, trucks or cars driving on highways could actually not just suspend the tire and brake wear microplastics, but any microplastics that happen to be on the road could be very efficiently suspended by this process too. So the, the plastics on the side of the road from macroplastics that are degraded, Anyway, it, so it, some combination of the direct emission or, and possibly the resuspension could be occurring um, with the tire and the brake sources. Now, of course, population centers, you, you would think, I mean, microplastics come from humans. And so we do have some observations of the amount of microplastics observed in city centers. And, and normally it's just numbers and they don't have an idea of the mass of it. So the size distribution isn't well known. And, and people have speculated that dry cleaners, laundry, um, incinerators, garbage could all be sources. Um, and it, so Janice Brainy, my, my collaborator on this, said that one of the best ways to get a standard for microplastics is to wash a um, fleece jacket. That's where you get a lot of microplastics. So, so we should really think about you know, all these plastics that we wear, basically, um, and the washing of those actually generate quite a bit of microplastics. Out. Um, and then you, that, that could be a really good way to get them into the water supply, for example, and then downstream or back onto agricultural fields. So how we approached this was we postulated these different sources um, and um, then used a transport model um, to get a source receptor relationship. And I'm sorry, there, there seems to be some kind of mess up with my, this, this is a very cute picture of <laughs> um, wastewater treatment, I think, being the solid waste applied to the agriculture here. Sorry about that. But um, um, we used the tire and brake source from the GAIN model that was published in Evangelou um, 2020. And so that's really, you know, that uh, I'll show you the distribution of that, but that's all roads and then, you know, a little more concentrated in cities, for example. Then we use an ocean source um, and the model itself generates a sea spray source. And we just overlay on top of that a map of the distribution of the microplastics. And we just assume that the microplastics um, have the same distribution as the Van Sibyl et al. And, and they call them microplastics, but remember they're a thousand times bigger, okay? We don't have any other information. We just assume they're concentrated basically in the gyres. 
um, along with the rest of the, um, the, the milliplastics, I would say. Then we also put in a source of like an agricultural dust source, as we talked about. And um, we also have a source, you know, we just kind of felt like there's got to be population centers have to be important. So, so what about, you know, the um, population centers and downwind from population centers after it's been processed a little bit, the dust from those regions could have higher um, microplastics. And then we put in population centers themselves as, um, a, you know, population as a proxy in the model. And again, then we take those sources and, and we look at the, the um, source receptor relationship. So um, we're looking at, really looking at long range transport. The observations are in these mountainous regions in the, in the Western United States. And we're really motivated by what happened, uh, what we saw from the Brainy et al paper. So there they showed that there's a correlation between the microplastics and the dust. Um, and then when we looked in more detail, um, also the sodium, which would be an indicator of the sea salts. We only have sodium in the wet deposition. So, you know, maybe there's the ocean source evidence, but the truth is that the sodium and the dust are actually correlated as well. So kind of all the aerosols are coming in together. So it's a little bit hard to pull that apart. Um, and then she also showed that they were correlated with population sources um, uh, that often they, the air masses had come from population sources. Um, but we have these 11 stations with the 313 individual data points and we, we pull the model results for the exact time period. So we get, you know, the winds come from different directions, different times of the year and even different weeks. And so we get a little more information from having more um, temporal information. We use um, kind of a souped up version of the CAM4 model where we've added six different bins um, there that, that aren't in the, the standard model. So at, at different sizes. Um, and we drive it with a reanalysis wind for the exact same time period, run one by one, and we output every day so that we can average over these right time periods. But the problem still is, is how in the world do we um, guess what the deposition rate is, the dry deposition rate of, of this person <laughs> here? This is just crazy. Um, this is not a sphere, our standard dry deposition rates are a sphere or even orboids, okay? This is the opposite of that. I mean, if you go back and you look at something like ice crystals and how they fall um, way back in the old literature, um, you, you'll see that, you know, an ice crystal, which is nice and smooth and long, that those tend to fall, um, you know, if they're long and thin, they fall much, much slower than if they were cute little spheres. Um, and so we basically just, um, take the, the real length, which here's the fiber length. Um, I remember they're about one micron thick. And here's the particle size. This, this um, one is the particle size. We don't move the particles because they're, they're close enough to spherical for, for us for a first cut. But we take the fibers um, and, and we move them down in size. So we have a big size, a medium size, and a small size. Um, and we just basically are, are changing the dry deposition rate so it's an order of magnitude or two slower than it would have been with that um, length of a particle. Because you, you just think that long, thin thing, is, it's got to have a way more drag on it and it's going to go down a lot, lot slower. But we're not really sure uh, which, which rate to, to use here. So we just use three different um, distributions. Oh, and I should say that 95% um, of the mass is actually those fibers that are so hard to, to figure out. And I remember how long they were. They're, they're really long. So, so just that we're finding them in these remote regions mean that they must be dry depositing very slowly. Um, so, so our methodology is we postulate these different sources, we stick them in the model. And so we have a source receptor relationship for each source and for each of our observations. And then we use an optimal estimation to get the source strength. Um, we also, we force each of the sources to match the size distribution at the deposition sites. OK, um, so uh, that um, we kind of remove that as an extra parameter, um, assuming that all these sources are contributing to the, the size distribution we see. Then the problem is, is, is no one has ever modeled this before, so we don't have any really good a priori estimates of what the uncertainties are. So we use a, a kind of a simple method um, using optimal estimation to get the source strength. So we minimize a chi-squared cost function where we're trying to minimize the, the difference between the observations and the model. Um, and you know, that's pretty straightforward. 
Um, but in order to get the uncertainties, we're going to iterate and use the chi-square to identify the 95% um, confidence. So we actually have to iterate to make sure that um, our um, posterior errors match our a priori errors. And so we had to do that a couple times to get them large enough, basically. Um, but then once you do that, then you can get your 95th percent um, confidence rates. So this is really good approach for a problem like this, where we don't actually know what the errors are. We're really doing the first modeling study. We do a whole bunch of um, sensitivity studies to see uh, you know, what kind of errors we can constrain here. And I'll show you the results of those. So um, if we take a look at the measurements and our contribution from these different sources at the measurement sites in the Western United States, the, the road source is the, the largest one. And if you concentrate here on the black at first, we've got our three different size distributions and our 95th percent uh, um, confidence intervals. And you can see that um, all three size distributions give us the, the same answer with the same confidence intervals here, basically. So um, most of the, um, the um, contribution at these sites is from the road source, according to the, in, the um, optimal estimation. We get a, a possibly an ocean source um, here as well. So maybe you know a, a few percent contribution from an ocean source, but it is dependent on the size. The ag dust source also you know a small contribution again dependent on the size, small contribution from a dust population source, and and the model really wants to the, the optimal estimation really wants the population source to be almost zero, um, or exactly zero. All right, so, and you can see all these error bars. Um, so we did a whole bunch of sensitivity studies where uh, we just use an annual average. So we remove the temporal information. So we only have 11 data points instead of 313. And you can see that the 95th percent confidence intervals um, go way up, okay? So that says that we are really getting some information out of the um, temporal evolution. So, you know, having multiple observations at the same site is really helpful. And if we remove one site, we also increase our uncertainty, our, uh, you know, our range here as well. So that's the green, green ones here. So that's interesting um, as well as, but it does turn out that the, looks like the temporal variation, you know, having 14 or 15 observations at the same site is, is actually just as valuable or more valuable than um, having more sites also, which is kind of interesting. So this is the picture we get over the Western US. So before I was showing you the contribution at the measurement sites, and here we're looking at the budget over the Western US. And again, I'm sorry about this. I don't know how this happened. Anyway, so um, we have a certain amount of um, microplastics, about 10 tons of microplastics suspended over the Western US. About 11% is coming from the ocean source. 84% um, is the road and breaking sources, a little bit from the ag soil emissions, 5%. Um, a little bit from close to population centers, and, and we don't think population centers themselves are a big source. But remember that road and braking emissions would be higher in cities. So, so this is the picture we get in terms of the budgets. Um, and uh, and oh, I already talked about our sensitivity studies here. So this is the, what we get in, in terms of our results, in terms of the annual average here. Um, so here we're looking at the Western United States. These are our observation sites with the, the colors. Behind it is the model values. And uh, here's our scale in micrograms per meter squared per year. Um, here's the coast and the coast of uh, Mexico dropped off here. Um, but these are you know, remote sites um, far away from uh, cities for the most part, you know, you've got Joshua Tree here, that's not so far. Um, but they all have about the same amount of microplastics. And that's why the population centers don't show up as um, good sources, because you would, you would um, if that were true, you'd get Joshua Tree much, much higher, because it's so close to LA, for example. You do see something um, uh, from the, the front range from, from Denver here, maybe a little bit higher, but not that you just don't have a really strong gradient in, in these remote regions. So it's, it, the model from the data, you know, the optimal estimation is trying to get kind of a, a broad source and the road source works well for that or the ocean source works well for that. But something like the population um, doesn't, it, it, it's, you know, it's going to be driven by these ones that are close to population centers not being that different than the other sources. Um, 
So this is what we get for the deposition and compared to the observations in an annual average. Here it is for every observation. And, and you can see that I, I would not say the model is doing a good job that there's no R squared that's statistically significant. We might be on the same planet. Not sure about that even, okay. We're in the right order of magnitude. That's all I can say. Um, so, you know, it's the first study. The, the good part about the data um, is that it's a remote region. So we're really seeing the long range transport. The bad part is it's really hard to get the transport right to remote mountainous regions. And these observations are preferentially in remote regions. So, um, you know, anyway, I would not claim that we're doing a very good job uh, with the, the simulations and, and the annual average, even we, we're not doing that great of a job either. Okay. So this is, you know, the model versus the OBS. Um, so the, basically this scatter plot from the annual average here, but, you know, maybe, we're order of magnitude kind of getting it right, perhaps. Um, and here's the contributions that we're getting. Here's the road source and you can see it's kind of diffuse. It's the strongest one. The ocean source, um, we are in a terrible places. You know, the sites are here. We're, we're in a terrible places to, to measure the ocean source, okay? So we're inferring a 5%, 10% contribution here um, you know, 10% to the region with, with almost no measurements uh, of those, right? And obviously the ocean source, you know, the, all the deposition will be right next to the ocean or back into the ocean. And so we're, we're not measuring it very, um, very well. Here's what the ag dust contribution is and the population dust contribution um, in the model. Um, and so this just pulls it all together. You know, these are remote sites. It's really hard to get right. The, if we look at our dust correlations or sea salt correlations, they're, they're not great um, or, or for plastics. And our, our, we're dominated by the contribution from the road, um, the combination of the brake and the tires, spelled like a UK person. Um, and, and we actually combined the brake and the tire. They gave us two distributions, but we combined them because you can't see the difference. Um, zero population from uh, zero contribution from population itself. Um, and uh, this is because of the, op the way that we're doing the optimal estimation, it's actually in some way, it'll, it'll actually try to get the median observation instead of the mean. But... Okay, so this is the first time anyone's tried to look at all these different sources and try to guess what matches, you know, these really beautiful observations that they made. Um, th Right, so like, do they make any sense at all? That, that was our question. Well, the, the tire braking source is actually smaller than what was published in the Evangelou than what they deduced there, but within their range. Now their range, they didn't know what the long range transported fraction was. And all we're looking at is the long range transported fraction. Um, so, um, you know, we overlap here a little bit on the, on the tail end, but we're smaller. The ag dust concentrations, if you, if you back out, you know, here's what our source was in the Western US and you get some ag dust um, estimates from Genoa et al. Then the concentration in the soils is something between seven and 400 milligrams per kilogram. And then you go in the literature and remember that huge range. Well, we're in the middle of that huge range. So these numbers are not inconsistent with the very limited observations. Now the ocean source could be huge, um, you know, it. it it's not making that big of a contribution to the Western US or to our sites, but it's making a huge contribution over the oceans. And it's actually, you know, nine teragrams per year is our, our median estimate on the global scale with 95% uncertainty, zero to 22, okay? So it could be zero and it could be 22, but it's really poorly observed with the data set that we're using right here. But I told you, you know, that um, Alan et al had observations in the boundary layer in France. And if we compare our concentrations at the same site, we're actually two orders of magnitude lower than what they observed. Okay, so once again, maybe, maybe we're right. Um, just for reference, you know, nine teragrams per year, we, we um, uh, black carbon is about 10 teragrams per year. So this would be huge. We don't know um, anything about the, the microplastics coming off of polluted areas or populated areas. So we don't have that information. So here we have a study that's really, we're limited in um, um, data to the Western US, but 
we're going to extend globally anyway. So we're just going to extrapolate um, and, and just see what the numbers come. We, we already did this to compare to the, the, the road source to the Evangelou. Um, and we, we have a smaller source than Evangelou. Now, th this could be because the US doesn't put plastics into roads. Evangelou was really based on observations in Europe. And in Europe, they put plastic into roads when they, when they pour asphalt, for example, there's plastics in there. So maybe we have lower rates of microplastic emissions because of that. Um, but it also could be because we don't know the, the airborne fraction to, um, in, in the Evangelou, they, they don't know what is long range transported and we're only looking at the long range transported. Or of course, you know, any kind of model errors here uh, or distribution errors, there's so many errors. Um, now our ocean source here, it, you know, this is the optimized global source. You, you can see the ocean source. It depends really very much on what size we're assuming, and it's just a huge range here. Um, but our concentrations are actually lower than Allen at all. Okay, so uh, I mean, we could be two orders of magnitude higher even. Anyway, compared to their observations. So anyway, we need much more observations of this. Um, the ag dust source is actually really important outside of the US, more important than in the US. So we need to check elsewhere. Um, and then if we're talking about how much goes from the land to the ocean, we have to be really careful about coastal grid boxes because they, they get all kind of messed up in the model. Okay. But here's what our distribution looks like. And you, you can see it's really big um, in terms of our deposition. It's really big in the ocean regions, right? Because we have this huge ocean source and then it's deposited right back down in the ocean. You know, the, the lifetime of these microplastics is not very long in the atmosphere because they're, they're kind of big. Um, and um, so this is what it could look like globally. You know, so we postulate this and we hope that more measurements will be taken. We can compare to the limited available data. And again, you know, I'm not saying that we're doing a great job with against these observations. Um, maybe we're on the same planet. Um, um, but here you can see what the sources are elsewhere. You know, the road source, um, it's kind of about the same size in the US as elsewhere. So maybe that's okay. The ocean source, we, we really don't observe very well at all. The agricultural source is much smaller um, in the US than it would be elsewhere if it were true the way that we did it. So, you know, the agricultural dust, we'd have to check. I mean, are they putting the bio? Um, solids on to the regions? Do they have as much microplastics in those regions? You know, we have a little bit of data um, up in, uh, you know, Ontario, but that's not where our dust sources are. We have a little bit of data in China. What's going on in these regions, right? So I'd say our agricultural dust source is just completely, you know, not something to believe, let's say, less believable than the rest of the analysis. And the same thing, you know, with the population dust, it's, it's really tiny where we're looking and then it'd be huge elsewhere. So we, we would, you know, it, these would need to be checked, definitely. Now, if we go back and think about, you know, are these numbers for the ocean source at all reasonable? Well, maybe, okay. So here is, um, let's see, here uh, is what our base case ocean concentrations would be to, to get the sea salt, or the sea spray source that we need to match the observations. Here and so this is in units of grams per kilometer squared, and and you can see our scale goes up to fifty, and then this is what I showed you in the beginning from Van Sibyl. Okay, and so this is this is you know the the four micron to you know maybe the biggest ones that um, Janice measured was like four hundred micron in length, and these are less than five millimeter sized. Okay, from the Van Sibyl, so totally different size fraction. Okay. Um, and it's in the same units as this top one, but look at the scale. Okay, so two, three orders of magnitude more of these milliplastics, I would call them, than we are, are deducing in microplastics. So again, there, there's nothing here to say that we're completely wrong. Let me just say it that way. Um, I'm not saying that we're right, but there's nothing here to say that we're completely wrong. And it, it could be higher. I mean, it all depends what you think, how the size fractionation should go as you go smaller than um, five millimeters versus uh, even a smaller one. Um, would those sink? Would those exist there? We, we don't know. So there's nothing in here that I would say that, that red flags this that says that our distribution isn't possible or even possibly higher.
So we, um, we actually get a net source of the oceans to the land. And of course, that's a little bit weird because the microplastics must be originating with the humans on land. But um, you know, there's a couple explanations for that. And the most likely one seems like there's microplastics going through the rivers to the ocean, right? In our waste, maybe from the laundry or whatever. And then it's being re um, put onto to, um, land. Or, you know, we're throwing macroplastics into the ocean and those are coming back as microplastics. It's really um, very unclear. So, you know, who cares? <laughs> Should we care? Well, basically, we don't really know the impacts of microplastics at this point. Um, it could be that it reduces uh, crop productivity. There's some evidence of that, but, um, the, you know, one study, microplastics can carry contaminants, which could also impact um, ecosystems or um, crops or humans. That's another mechanism. It's going to impact higher trophic levels. You know, there's a couple studies speculating about that. What about if it gets in your lungs? You, you would think any you know, particle that gets in your lungs would be a problem, um, but that, that's not necessarily going to be the microplastics. It'd be the even smaller size fraction, which we were unable to measure, like the nanoplastics. That would be even more of a concern here. The climate impacts. So just um, uh, last year, the Ravel et al. study, 2021, calculated the radiative forcing. Um, now they used um, basically the city uh, estimates. Um, and so they didn't have an ocean source. Um, and you know, if, if you don't have an ocean source, you're gonna be even smaller, right? Uh, in terms of our, our deposition. And I actually calculated the aerosol optical depth um, using very simple assumptions. And you can't see a microplastic signal in that. There, there's almost no microplastics in the atmosphere. They don't contribute very much to the AOD and they don't contribute very much to the radiative forcing. Um, and so it, it, all makes, it, it all makes sense. It's super small. What they got was super small. Um, so probably if you multiply a super small number by you know, even a hundred times more to include the ocean sources, it's still super small. It, it's not very important. It's, it's only if you, um, it, you know, I had to multiply our, uh, our microplastic source by something like 100, then you start to just see it um, in terms of an AMD. Um, but it could be an ice nuclei. Um, it, it's got some crystalline structure um, and there could be some snow or ice impacts. Um, in this study, they, they assumed that the plastics were kind of clear or white, but a lot of the plastics aren't clear or white. They're, they're black or, or blue and you know, it doesn't change too much what their area OD is, but they, they could be more warming and that could make an impact on snow or ice then. Solutions, well, there's, there's lots of studies talking about ways to cut plastics. Um, I mean, one of the, the issues is, is we don't know if it's the big plastics breaking down that's causing the microplastics, like I, I said, or is it the laundry you know, of our fleece jackets causing the microplastics directly? So we don't actually know what the sources are at this point. But people really want to cut plastic pollution um, generally. So, you know, here's some studies talking about this. You know, there's lots of studies here um, um, and, uh, you know, really looking at what, what could be done to, to cut the plastics. It's, it's not clear, though, if you cut the big plastics, you know, like the plastic bottles and, and the things that are collecting in the middle of the ocean gyre, are you cutting the, the microplastics or not, right? Because we don't quite understand the sources. So if I summarize here, um, you know, we really tried to motivate off these beautiful set of observations, extremely painful to make that um, Janice Branny and her um, co-authors um, put together. And it, they represent the deposition in remote regions from long range transport. So that's really good because it tells you what's going on in remote regions, but it is hard to model correctly. We use a model for the same time period and we try to deduce the size of the sources. So we use the model to get the source receptor relationship. We get it's dominated by roads. Ocean could be huge globally, but really poorly observed by our data set. And maybe agriculture dust could be important too, especially if microplastics are being um, put onto fields. It basically, what we're kind of arguing is the resuspension of microplastics is really important. But you know, it could be that laundries are actually directly emitting microplastics. We, we simply don't have that information on that. We need way more observations and way more temporal resolution. Um, and any kind of trend, coastal budgets, land to ocean or ocean to land is really sensitive to the, to the resolution. Uh, 
you know, we would argue that we actually have more questions than answers in this study. Um, and we, you know, just trying to lay out some of the what's going on. Now there is, a, I don't know if you saw that this in the last week, there was a meeting to, to actually control plastics. Um, they're probably gonna focus on the macro plastic problem, which is huge, um, but people are waking up that plastics um, could really be a problem. Um, what, what you know, we, we would argue would be really important is we need to understand the ecosystem and the human impacts. You know, maybe it's okay to have all these <laughs> microplastics floating around. What, what's really important to recognize is the way that it was accounted in the Brainy et al. study, you can't get anything smaller than four microns. Um, and the, it's really hard to have a, an observational method for the nanoplastics, anything smaller than four micron. But those would be the ones that would stay in the atmosphere much longer and um, potentially get farther um, and then get into your lungs. So we, we need to understand those. They might have completely different sources. Now, there are ways to figure out what polymer types we're, we're talking about, because you know, in this study, all we're doing is looking at the, the proximal, the, the last source, right? That's all. We're not saying what the original source of the plastics was. So if you want to get rid of it, you, you've got to trace it back and figure out what the original source was. Um, but one could do that from information about the polymer types. And um, Janice didn't have that in her data set, but that is possible to do that kind of analysis. And then we would have a little more information about the um, original source of it. And then of course, there's potential for some climate impacts um, uh, of some of these, especially through the ice nuclei. And that's all I had. Thank you very much for listening. I'm uh, glad to talk about any of your questions if I can answer them. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that talk, um, Natalie. That was uh, very eye-opening. And like you said, more questions than answers. All right. Well, thank you very much. I did find that really interesting. I think there's a lot of open questions. Um, I, 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 I agree. We need to know a lot more about the uh, you know, biological cycling of these plastics and, and what, what the consequences are. Um, but I, I found that very interesting and I appreciate uh, everybody for uh, coming out today. And so we are coming up at five o'clock. So we're, we're going to conclude. Uh, this is the conclusion of today's DeFord lecture. Uh, let's thank, if you can't hear them, you can't see them, but <laughs> there's the applause coming from the ether.